do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time, all of the time. Let's start off by saying good morning to all that have decided to tune in to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. We're heard here on blogtalkradio.com. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'd like to say a special thanks to the Gatewood Brothers who make sure that Mr. Fuller and myself sound the way we do. If it wasn't for them looking out for our interests, it just wouldn't work right. But thank you. The Gatewood Brothers. I affectionately, you will affect, you will hear me say affectionately calling <laughs> Mr. Leon Moon Pie. Only those over a certain age know what Moon Pies are. But anyway, Moon Pie. They, I can see him smiling now. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, brother. And Miss Sharon, who occasionally fills in when Mr. Robert has other obligations. So we want to thank her. So give her a, a mention. Uh, Robert, that we uh, mentioned her on the phone. Mr. Fuller and I, thank you for listening, most of all, and for your contributions to the books. Uh, I have some demographics, uh, but I'm not going to give them to you, or analytics, uh, I guess would be a better word. But the program is worldwide from a lot of different countries that are tuning in, primarily the um, concept called the USA and the United Kingdom, but there are some other countries, at least eight more of the more prominent countries, that this program goes on worldwide. And occasionally I will read some Gmails from those people who are in those other concepts. So let me say again good morning and thank you for uh, <clears throat> listening to the program, and if you would like to get in contact with the program, simply dial 516-453-9921, and be sure to press the number one button, and you will get in line to be heard. You can also Gmail me, although I would not recommend it uh, because we're so backed up with those Gmails, but if you elect to do that, you can here it is. The, my email address is the numeral seven, Mr. Bobby, B O B B Y at Gmail dot com. And you can also get into the tr- chat room, which is exploding as I am looking at my screen. Even new people have uh, got in here. But as usual, Helen B. She, Helen B. Sixty nine was first. <laughs> Thank you, Helen B. Rita Triple A. I'm always referring to her. Swa is there. Produce twenty one is there. Jacoby Two Kane Two is there. And um, Chlorolution. And I'm I'm real bad at at saying words, so forgive me for that. Be good one is also uh, in the um, in the house, and we do uh, thank you. If you'd like to get into the chat room, all you have to do is go to blogtalkradio.com and go to the uh, Produce Justice um, page there. Click on it, and you're there. You're there. Okay. Let's see here. Yes, okay. So we're going to start off the uh, program by saying good morning, Mr. Fuller, and how are you this morning? Good morning. I'm still learning. Okay. What are you, before we go to the uh, Gmail, Mr. Fuller, what are you still learning today? People always ask me some of your interests, so here you go. What are you still learning today? Everything that goes on. I, I check the news uh, at night uh, before I go to bed. I look at television. I look at a lot of television, and I flip channels. <laughs> I flip channels 
you know, every channel. I go to scream through every channel trying to pick up whatever bits of what is re- being reported. Mm-hmm. And I take newspapers. Uh, recently I've been able to get around to a lot of the articles in some of the papers. I had to cancel some papers uh, because I have a time constraint. But uh, And I have a lot of books I've been trying to get to to look at that I have never even opened, but I have them available. Uh, I would like to look at the, uh, the 1619 Project book. Yes. Uh, uh, I understand it's in a book form now. And that uh, since people are talking about this thing called critical race theory, a lot. There's lots of controversy. They say it's affecting everything that's political, and people are taking sides and doing a lot of shouting and cursing and whatnot, which, according to the code, is completely unnecessary. We can talk about race in a uh, manner that doesn't require that type of activity, which just gets in the way. It's not problem solving. So that's what I uh, think about. That's what I try to learn, how to best go about solving this problem we call the race problem. What is the best way to even talk about it? We haven't discovered that yet, apparently, since a lot of people, you know, they said it's so emotionally, it's so emotionally charged that you can't talk about it. Well, if it's a problem, we're put here, presumably, and this is the conclusion I've come to, we're put here on this planet to solve problems. So it just comes down to how we're going to go about solving the problems that we're put here to solve. And Mm. I came to that conclusion that we're put here to solve problems because we have problems. If we weren't put here to solve problems, we wouldn't have the problems to solve. But we have problems to solve every day, all day. And when I say we, I mean all of the people on the planet. I mean, yes. you've got to get out of the hut and, and go down the trail. And you got to go six miles and carry water on your head. That's a problem. Because now you discovered that somehow a hole got in the bucket. And it's the only bucket you have. Now, that is a problem. Now, you can say, well, I can ignore it, but you're going to need water. All people, all creatures, all plants need water. Mm -hmm. So these are the things that I think about. Problem solving. It's just about those two words. People talk about critical race theory. We're talking about problem solving. Mm -hmm. Either we have a problem or we don't. Now, which is it? You know, and all problems are solved through what? According to logic. Through the process of questions, questions and answers. And answers, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Special shout out to, now, hang on, everybody. I'm going to try to get this right. Cholo Revolution. If I got that right, smile at me, man. All right, let's get on with the uh, Gmails, Mr. Fuller. This comes from a good friend, uh, Rachel, or Rachel. She says this, Mr. Fuller, according to counter-racism code, should we only consider a person as having intellect if this person finds a way to end racism and becomes universal man or universal woman. Yeah, if the person should do what now? Wait a minute, like let me go that. back. I'd like to have okay. repeat it. Okay. I'll re- she says, according to counter-racism code, should we only consider a person as having intelli- intellect if this person finds a way to end racism and becomes universal man or universal woman. Well, you you just recognize the truth. Even a person, either a person is universe, has qualified to be 
a universal man and universal woman, or the person hasn't. And according to compensatory counter-racist logic, it's no way to be a universal man and a universal woman in the system of white supremacy. That's not going to happen. So it's not. So you know, you would first have to get rid of the system of racism in order to have a universal man and a universal woman, in order for a universal man and a universal woman to function. Now, that should be our goal, but the first step is you have to get rid of the system of racism in order to have space and the, and the resources and everything that it takes and the kind of world that it would take, the kind of environment you have to have to produce universal man and universal woman. But but that should be the goal of every person in the universe. Why? We are in the universe. So we should have universal people. And what does that mean, universal people? It means people who always do the correct thing in everything. You know, in other words, you first of all, uh, what are some of the characteristics? The, well, a universal man, universal woman, does not knowingly say anything that is not true, not ever. You don't say anything that's not true to anybody. And uh, number two, speaks and acts as if sexual intercourse and sexual play between people is always between a male person and a female person, exclusively. Now, that's basic sex. Now, there might be other types of sex. You don't get mad at people or call them names or anything like that if they say, oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, there, there are thousands of ways to have sex. I mean, you know, we're just exploring maybe by, uh, 10 or 12, but maybe there might be two or 300. I mean, uh, and sex would... All not only between people, but between creatures and people. I mean, we, we should be trying that. I mean, that's the intelligent thing to do. That's the sophisticated thing to do. That is what we call progress. But see, but universal man and universal woman would still be male with female, and that would be basic in a universal man and universal woman. So that's what black people, that's why according to the code, we are... We say that we try that first because we haven't got that correct yet before we start experimenting with and exploring with other uh, interactions between people. You get yes. more confusion when you do that. We mm-hmm. haven't gotten the male-female thing not even off the ground yet like it ought to be. Yes, sir. Now, part of, somebody asked me, you, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. West, you asked me about... You know, what have I learned lately and, and what, what the news is? When I turn on the news, what do I see? Yesterday, I turned on the news, and I saw where uh, there's a huge increase since COVID-19 in males killing females. That more arguments are breaking out in, the, in every house, white and non-white. Lots of killing going on. Lots of males, and, and then they recounted some events. Uh, mm-hmm. Females shot two or three times by a boyfriend, all this type of stuff, and more and more violence, male against female. Lots of it, everywhere, and as far back as I can remember, that's been true. Mm-hmm. So when we talk about universal man and universal woman, you don't have none of that. That, that, that's a no-no. That doesn't happen at all, period. Violence between somebody that you said that you cared about and you had a falling out about something and it turned violent, that, that's simply, you know, you have disagreements. All people have disagreements, but it's going to call for violence with someone that you chose to be intimate with and they chose you, and then that's going to turn violent. That should be completely unheard of, okay? So that's just a couple of things. Yes, sir. uh, The textbook for victims of white supremacy has a list of things that would qualify 
I mean, just a short list, just starting on the journey of qualifying for universal man and universal woman. It's in the textbook for victims of white supremacy that people can get by going to ProduceJustice.com. Yes, sir. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, let me say this. This is the December the 7th, 2021 edition of the Counter-Racist Code Show here on Blog Talk Radio. Uh, this day is, is, I guess, famous in the concept called America on December the 7th, 1941, when the uh, Japanese uh, Empire bombed Pearl Harbor. There will be a lot of things written about that today. Those that are new to the program, you're going to hear some things and some terms, such as VGQ, I don't know. A logic. You're going to have some terms that you may or may not agree with, but that that's okay. Keep on listening, and you'll you'll get some of the things. And there may be other terms, but whatever you hear, if you have a question about it, then logically seek the answer for that uh, question. Uh, before we do take questions, let's see. Let me get this. This is from Stan the Man says this, hello, Mr. Bobby, this is an open letter that George Washington and Williams penned to King Leopold II. If you read this letter, sir, you will see how whites use their knowledge of physical science and technology in the Belgian Congo to deceive the native Africans into believing that white people were almost, quote, superhuman, end of quote. Mr. Williams gives us a window into what he witnessed during his time in the presence of a master white of master white supremacists. Also, Mr. Fuller talked about the massive atrocities that occurred in the Belgian Congo. This is true, and unfortunately, most of our most are unaware of this. Adam Hochschild's Charles book quote. King Leopold's Ghost, a story of greed, terror, and heroism in colonial Africa, end of quote, explains this horrific period of human history. Then he had some links uh, uh, on this. Um, Mr. Fuller, uh, before we do take our calls here, you have, um, Mr. Wells, indicated that you knew a little something about what went on in the Belgian Congo? No, I don't. <laughs> That's just okay. the problem. I, I, uh, I've heard just enough to believe that even the stories that I have heard okay. come, no, come nowhere close to the atrocities committed by the white supremacists in that place called the Congo, and it still goes on. It's never stopped. It's never stopped. It's just waxed and waned. There have been more atrocities than others. I mean, but that's even on a minute-by-minute, day-by-day basis everywhere. But I'm saying it's just been nonstop, nonstop. There's never been any breathing room at all, not for five minutes. There's some type of atrocity, some things that are happening that shouldn't be happening based on racism that's affecting that area of the world just like it does Every area of the world. We're talking about a world system here. But uh, I, I, at an early age, I learned about somebody called King Leopold and mm-hmm. what he was doing in that a place called the Congo. And they said, it's just somebody needs to be awakened to it and somebody needs to do something about it. But nobody was doing anything. He just had a blank check. Just to go around and slaughter people at will and whatnot. You know, it's just bloodbath everywhere. Uh, kill black people like you're killing flies. I mean, routine. Nobody thinks anything of it. Kill them. Well, kill them. Well, I mean, it ain't worth nothing. No way. Get out of the way. You know? I mean, well, are they animals or whatnot? Hey, they're worse than animals. <laughs> They're worse than hmm. flies. They're worse than roaches. Hmm. I mean, rather have roaches than have those black people around. I mean, that's the way they were looked upon and treated. 
from what I understand. And I have read very little about it because I saw very little at the time I was trying to find out about it that was published. And I believe that everything, like the code says, we mm-hmm. know very little history of anything. When, when say we, people on the planet, period, we just know just a small bit of history of all mm-hmm. the things that have happened. Just a tiny bit, not even a, what you would call knowing anything at all compared to all the things that happened. In particular, all the things that happened under the rulership of the white supremacists. I, I think we know, and when I say we, I mean everybody who is completely knowledgeable or supposed to be completely knowledgeable or mostly knowledgeable about the history of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. I say that all the minds put together, every black historian, every white one, every, everybody who has gotten in on it and say we're going to write a complete history of the system of white supremacy, even with the greatest research, they would probably come up with maybe about a fraction of 1% of all the things that really did happen that should not have happened. That's that's just my own judgment Hmm, of what I've learned about history. Very little history is known or can be known. Why? Most of it was never known. It was it, it was erased. It was gone forever. I mean, things that have happened, and, and a lot of it never was recorded. Most of it was never recorded in the first place. All of the incidents that happened throughout the entire history of the existence of the system of white supremacy, no way but that they ever be known. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's millions of times greater. The atrocities of it. Yes, sir. Probably, when you go through and just look at every incident of racism, you're talking about millions. How can it be known? Yes. Okay. All righty. Talking about logic. Talking about logic, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yes, logically speaking, how can it be known? How can the history of anything, even the history of a grain of sand, be known Mm -hmm. by a person here in the known universe. You don't Mm -hmm. know the whole history of a a grain of sand. Mm -hmm. You might know enough to function with the grain of sand, but nobody knows the history of a grain of sand who is a mortal, meaning a person. Nobody. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, before I go to this question, let me ask you this, Mr. Fuller. Um, <clears throat> would you have an, an objection to somebody uh, translating your writings and audio into another language so that the people of that language, let's say, for example, Spanish or French, they don't speak or understand English, but a person that does understand it, uh, was, is able to translate your writings and audio into, let's say, Spanish or French. Uh, would you have any objection to that? No. Okay. But it would have to be done in a correct manner. Okay. Uh, and that would be determined by some people who handle that type of thing for me. Uh, okay. They're looking into it. I would like to, yes. See, I just speak in a ragged way, and anybody who reads my writing and knows that it's pretty ragged, uh, what has been given to me called the English language. Mm-hmm. And I would like for all people to understand exactly what I am saying, white and non-white, throughout the entire planet. Mm-hmm. Every person. I'd like to see um, what I, my feeble efforts yes, to... Sir. Oh. Put out what I have put out. I like to see it in Swahili and French and and mm-hmm. all the tribal languages. I mean, just three or four hundred people in, in the Amazon. I like for them to be aware mm-hmm. of this thing mm-hmm. called racism and how it's in, the biggest impediment 
to people mm. being the way that they ought to be here in the year 2021. Okay. So um, if a person wanted to uh, uh, translate your work into the different language of the people that they represent, would they uh, have to contact your representatives to... Uh, they have to go to ProduceJustice.com and okay. go from there. Just say what their proposal is. Okay, that, that's ProduceJustice.com. Go straight Produce to Justice. it and make a proposal. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Wanted to clear that up out the way. John, in H-Town, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question this morning? Grand Rising, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Bobby, Mr. Yes, sir. Fuller, my comments this morning I want to take in the context of Dr. Francis Cress Welton's statement of white genetic annihilation. And it's interesting to listen to his commentary or his observations about King Leopold, so I won't be able to respond in such limited time to that specifically, but I wanted to frame that with the question in this fashion. Is it possible or ever feasible to completely understand the motivations of a person, whoever they may be, to call themselves white and then in the context of the need to be white, to survive as white, according to Dr. Francis Cress Welton, then there will be the need to exterminate blackness, black people, or those that are described as heavily melanated. So when I'm proposing that notion first, taking her respectful research directly from Mr. Fuller, Jr., that she says is her mentor and has gave her the seeds and the concepts and the ideas of these things, white genetic annihilation, can we really ever get a grasp of understanding it to be able to affect change, to end white supremacy as the system, as he says repeatedly every week, and thereby producing justice? Will it be doing that in actually ending it, dismantling it, without harming the people who think they are, claim they are, so-called white people, a la a King Leopold? And I'd like the whole to be able to listen to his response. Thank you again for the time, Mr. Bobby. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Um, Mr. Fuller, um, what would you say your response to, would be to uh, what John said? Well, the question was kind of long. So, yes. Uh, which, what, excuse me. Which I, reminds if can, me. If I can understand it, what yes. he's saying, is it possible for white people to survive without practicing white supremacy. Sometimes I think that's a simple way of asking the question. I don't know whether that's the way he was asking the question or not. Uh, I say that it's possible for all species to survive without mistreating <clears throat> another species. Species, I mean, you have a species right within the same family. Not a, not everybody in the same family, so-called family, or real families, is the same height, the same weight. I mean, you have eight people in a family. You say, we are a family of eight. And you look at a photograph of the people, they all look different. But they are species. They're spe a specimen something special. Every person is something special because every person is something special. And so it's the same way with color. You, have, you can have people who are white. You can have people who are non-white because you have people who are white and non-white on the same planet who can perform like the universal man and universal woman, be people who are truthful, people who believe in practicing justice, people who believe in guaranteeing that nobody is mistreated, and people who believe in guaranteeing that the person that needs help the most gets the most constructive help, just like you would in a, what you call, quote, unquote, a nuclear family, a family of eight people, or a tribe of 50 people, each member of that tribe, even those who are 
giving birth to other members. Don't look exactly alike. They are similarities, but they are individuals, and that individuality should be regarded. The United Independent System that my book is based on, that's why I call it United Independent. You're united with other people, presumably, or, or, or need to be. But you are an individual. I use the word independent, but we are interdependent on a lot of things. But it's called the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. And so all people are different. Each individual person is different. They're supposed to be. But each individual person is similar to another person, even a person of another color or a person of non-color, like white is considered to be in the system of white supremacy. That's why they call black people colored people or people of color, because they say white is not a color when you start talking about people. It's the absence of color. Well, that's not a crime having an absence of color in your skin. A crime is how you act based on it. What do you do? Do you mistreat people? That's all we're talking about here. That's why years ago when people were going around with signs saying, I'm black and I'm proud, I put it in the textbook, the original version, and said it at meetings and whatnot. Sometimes uh, black people didn't particularly like what I was saying, but I was saying it because I had come to the conclusion that it's logical. And yes, I sir. said, never say that you're black and proud, ever. And never say that you're ashamed to be black, ever. Why? Logically speaking. Because you didn't have anything to do with it, that's why. Why take credit for something you didn't do? You didn't have nothing to do with that. You came here that way. Because whatever put produced you just made that decision. And that should be fine with you. Whatever produced you. And that would be the creator, ultimately, of all things. So I've been told. That's the source of it. So you're not ashamed of it? If you're five feet two, in height, you're not ashamed of it. If you're six foot one, you're not ashamed of it. And if your skin color is dark brown, you're not ashamed of it. If it's midnight black, blacker than the black holes in outer space, you're not ashamed of it, and you're not proud of it. You are. You know, that is what it is. That's why I say that if a white person says, I don't like you because you're black, you can say, well, hey, don't take that up with me. <laughs> That's between you and your my creator. All right? <laughs> and good luck with that argument. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, it's just that simple. You yes, don't sir. take you, you, know, you don't get mad about it or anything like that. You say, oh, you don't like me because I'm black. All right, well, hey, well, you can't talk to me about that. I, I don't have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you start that argument with somebody else. <laughs> I mean, you know, track it down and mm -hmm. beat them up, whatever you want to do. I mean, but that's between you and them. <laughs> Whoever right made even. me black. That's, what, that's where your argument, sir, is. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. here on Blog Talk Radio. I am the co-host, Mr. Bobby. Now, to get in contact with the show, simply dial 516-453-9921, or you can email me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y at gmail.com. Now, if you elect to call, I'm going to ask, please, ma'am, please, sir, as you just heard, Please make your questions, or even your VGQ, please make it short so that Mr. Fuller can stay with whatever question that you are asking. 
Please, ma'am, please, sir, could you do that, and would you do that? Just make it short and sweet and so that Mr. Fuller can directly answer your question. Now, I'm going to thank you in advance, because if you don't do it, ain't nothing I'm going to do about it anyway, but I'm going to ask you, please do that. Okay, for my new listeners, you can, you're, you're able to call in, and I'm going to ask you to, you're going to hear a lot of different terms on this program, in terms that you may not have heard, terms that you may not agree with, definitions. All I'm going to say is uh, ask questions about it. And use logic, log, logic, use logic in answering uh, that so that you can get a clear understanding of what's going on because we want you to use logic that you can get a, and you will hear this term, a constructive result. And all this information that I'm uh, uh, talking about and what Mr. Fuller is talking about can be obtained by getting his books, which he will discuss uh, in, a, in, a, in a few here, and you can go to the site if you'd like at ProduceJustice.com. That's ProduceJustice.com. And all the information that you could possibly want, even past shows, are on there that you can hear. I contacted a few people last week, and they went back and got a few of those shows and were delighted in listening to get a flavor of what this program is all about. And I'm going to tell you it right now, there are some people that are on the chat that are very protective of this show and uh, what is being said by Mr. Fuller. So just have you know, because they get you. All right. I don't know about that last part, but anyway, let's do this. Marcus, my man, New York. Yeah. Okay, Marcus, you're in the house. Go ahead, brother. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, Good sir. Good morning, sir. Uh, I have two questions, if time permits. Uh, my go, first go ahead, please, is, sir. Uh, my first question is, uh, Mr. Fuller, guns have become so much of a problem that the most recent school shooting was on page five of the newspaper last week. Um, my question for today is, in order for us to solve the gun problem or for that to be taken care of, wouldn't we need to take care of uh, racism, white supremacy first, which seems to be the root cause of the gun problem? Absolutely. The white supremacists are the cause of all these problems. Because why? According to evidence, they took charge of the world. So any problem that anybody has, I mean, the captain of the ship, that's who they are. Those white people who brag about being white supremacists, they, you know, if they want to brag about it, and some of them do, a lot of them claim that they are not white supremacists, but the few that do go around bragging about it, they're telling the truth that they are in charge. They tell non-white people all over the world what to do and what they better not do in all areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, Law, politics, religion, sex, and war. That's what supreme means. You tell other people, a supreme person of any kind, in any situation, just two people in a room, and one of them is going to be supreme, the person who is supreme, whatever that person tells the other person, what to do and what to bet not do, is a supreme person. They have supremacy over the other person. And the white supremacists came up with a system called the System of White Supremacy in capital letters that became a government of the entire planet called Earth. And all of the people who are classified as non-white come under that system. So it's the white supremacists who are to blame for all of the school shootings and everything else that goes on that shouldn't happen. Because, first of all, they should have never set up a system based on mistreating people based on color or mistreating people based on anything. Before the beginning of white supremacy, there was mistreatment, I'm sure, of some type or another. We don't want to go back to that either. But when the system of white supremacy came into being, which is what we have now, it's guaranteed 
to mistreat people because that's what it's for. They brag about mistreating people. That's why they worship guns, weapons. I mean, you turn on the television, everything is about what? Killing. 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 It's celebrating today, December the 7th, 1941. Yes, sir. The bombing of Pearl Harbor. About killing. And that is pointed out. In the background here, I hear a siren. You know, somewhere somebody might be distressed because, you know, they might be sick. And then somebody might try to shoot somebody. A lot of times when you hear the ambulance in the middle of the night, that's what's going on. When you hear a lot of ambulances, it might be an auto accident. And that's negligence. We don't have to have all these auto accidents, but we take it for granted. Every year, that whole armies of people are going to die from what? From 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 uh, crashes on the highway. This is all under the system of white supremacy. We just take for granted that this is normal. This is natural. This is completely unacceptable. This is insanity. And we just turn the page. Well, you know, a busload of students, you know, collided with a semi-trailer, all of them killed, big explosion, traffic tied up for eight miles, all right, for about six hours. And we just say that, well, whole hum, turn the page. See, this type of thing under the system of white supremacy, it is mass insanity. Death is something that's considered almost fun. That's why we have novels that are written. Most of them are about killing. Detective stories. Horror stories. Halloween. Mm -hmm. All about worshiping what? Death. Death. The system Mm -hmm. of white supremacy is closely associated with death making and glorifying death. That's why it ought to be gotten rid of. Yes, sir. We don't um, need a system like that. Mm-hmm. No more of this. Okay. Uh, Marcus, quickly, very quickly, what is your second question? Uh, my second question is that earlier Mr. Uh, Fuller was uh, talking about how COVID-19 has uh, heightened the rate between males um, administering violence against uh, females. So my question is, wouldn't um, COVID-19 be the reason, could be part of the reason for that, because most people have lost jobs, um, their sanity has gone low because of COVID, and money has been, you know, taken away from folks. So don't you think, or do you think that COVID-19 could have been part of the reason why males have been um, administering more violence towards women? Okay, thank you. Mr. Fuller? Well, in your question, you you – Connected COVID-19 with job loss. Okay, why would a, so let's go to, let's use logic. Questions and answers. Why would COVID-19 be connected with job loss? And why would a person have job loss? And why does a person need a job that was lost? So it comes down to and answer these questions, one question right after another, and you come up with the answer. person needs a job in order to make money. And if a person doesn't have money, the person can't pay for things like all the things that are needed from job loss, and then you add a disease on top of it, and you have to deal with the disease, and the people who had the job lost the job because of the disease because they couldn't go to the job. And so that brought on strife between the people who were dependent on the people who had money, who had the job, before they got COVID-19. So there's the connection. There's always a connection. So you have a society set up where you have to struggle to get money 
and you have people who control the money. And those people in the system of white supremacy are white supremacists. Because white supremacists control everything about non-white people on the planet we call Earth. Not only when it comes to jobs, but in everything that's connected with, in alphabetical order, economics, education. You see, black people, dark people all over the world saying, I got to go where I can get an education. I can't get an education where I am. They say, well, there's a whole lot of people where you are. Are they, you know, what, what do they know? Can they teach you something? What not? No, they can't teach me anything. I mean, well, how many people in your village, sir? Oh, uh, 10,000. Oh, it's a huge village. 10,000 people. Very large village. And the people there don't know anything. You have to get on a boat and go somewhere to learn something that you need to know. I have to get on a boat or a plane or something and go a long way, sir, to learn what I need to know and bring it back to my village of 10,000. You got 10,000 people here, and they don't, they don't know enough that you could stay here and learn what you need to know. No. Well, why do you need to leave? Why do you need to go? Because I have to go where the people who have knowledge are. Oh, well, and where are these people? Well, they are a long ways from here. And who are these people? Well, people tell me that they are people who know a whole lot. And who are these people who know a whole lot? Well, if you want a physical description, first of all, they are white people. Oh, so you are black. And in order to get what you call that second area of activity, education, you are black, and you have to talk to somebody who is what? White, all over the world, yes, all over the world. Now, that tells us something right there. Who's in charge yes. of the world? Mm-hmm. Okay. It might oh. be the white supremacists. Might be. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's an answer to the, all questions. All roads lead to the white supremacists. That's why they're called white supremacists. We're supreme when it comes to economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex. And we're definitely supreme when it comes to the ninth area of activity, war. Yes. We can okay. beat anybody, beat their socks off if they got any socks. And if they got socks, they got them from us. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Listen to everybody that's on the line. Uh, uh, my producer has indicated there are many, many people on the line. In fact, this is the most that's on the line, and I'm going to try to make sure that I get every single one of you. So this is what I'm going to do. One question. I'm going to ask you to ask one question and then make it brief, please, ma'am, please, sir, so that Mr. Fuller can answer your question, that we can get everybody in. Now, could you do that today? Just one question and make it quick so Mr. Fuller can answer that question. Okay, thank you very much. Let's start off, and by the way, Marcus, uh, don't be a stranger. Let's start off with Stan. Uh, Stan, very quickly, we're going to go to you. What is your question for Mr. Fuller? Go ahead, please, sir. Yes, sir. If I could just speak briefly on that, uh, going back to the, the Belgian Congo quickly, that was um, – the, the book, Adam Hofchild, was an excellent book, but I, I could not stress enough the letter that George Washington Williams wrote. If people will take the time to read that letter, they will get an understanding as to how the Belgians tricked, so how they, the psychological games they played on the Africans to take over and to be the supreme being. That is the main aspect of that. Um, but the, the question that I have is, um, Mr. Fuller, it was, on YouTube, it was an art, a audio of you talking about how do we deal with House Negroes, Uncle Toms, to sell out blacks. But the audio was cut short. 
And so I was trying to get an understanding as to what your final um, understanding or analysis was about this, because I, th- I feel that the that this element of the House Negro and the Uncle Tom that they've presented throughout history, a very confusing aspect to us seeking justice in the workplace and society and politics. And I've even met white people that will tell me, oh, you know, I really like Thomas Sewell or I like uh, Herschel Walker and people like that. And so I just wanted to ask you, um, what is your, what would you have further to say about that? And would you consider putting that in some of your further writings? And I'd like to stay on the line. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Fuller? It's in the textbook. The textbook says all non-white people in the system of white supremacy are prisoners of war. All prisoners of war are equal. Now, one prisoner of war in a cell with another prisoner, and I'll give this illustration. Maybe people can understand it forever if I put it in this context. Two prisoners, people wearing the same uniform. Our prison uniform, if you are non-white, is a person of color. That's your prison uniform. So you're equal prisoners. So one prisoner says, I like I like it here. I'm better off in here than I am anywhere else. I was on the streets on the outside, begging. I, I get, this is an excellent place. This is the best place I've ever been from where I came from. And I came across the ocean and whatnot, and I got in a place like this. I, I eat better food than I had when I was in my village. Because... It's what you call a first-class, well-run prison, that particular, uh, what I call a cell, with a greater confinement, because you're born in confinement if you're non-white. I'm giving a long-winded illustration here of what I'm talking about. But he says he's satisfied with the way everything is. He don't want to go no place else, right where he is. The other prisoner is sitting there trying to figure out, how am I going to get a hole in this wall I, I hope that they leave that door unlocked. I'm out of here. Uh, I, I got to work with my lawyer. I got to do something. I am going crazy in here. I can't stand it. I can't stand one more day. I, I'm, I'm on the verge of being suicidal. And this person I got as a cellmate is talking about he's in heaven. He loves it just the way it is. Don't nothing need to be changed. He says he sleeps on a better bed than he ever had. And I'm saying uh, things can be a whole lot better. Things, even if things are not better, I don't need to be bunched up in here. I don't need to be confined under any circumstance to nothing on the basis of my color. Now, this has been going on like forever. And then the name calling starts, and then what happens? A fight breaks out between the two cellmates. And after the fight, after they get through knocking each other's teeth out, both of them still have to do what? Answer to the prison master, like in the movie Shawshank Redemption, when one of the prisoners on his first night in prison starts saying, I want my mommy. I want my mother. And the other prisoners started laughing at him, saying, I've had your mother. She wasn't that great. But then the guard came in, very brutal guard, Byron Haddon, in the movie Shawshank Redemption. That was his name. And he says, you make one more sound, and you're going to wish you hadn't. And the guy says, I want to get out. I'm not supposed to be here. And he snatched him out of the cell and beat him to death with a club. And says, now, anybody else, you know, if you all don't get the message, try me. Why? Because I run the prison. Doesn't make no difference how much noise you all make among each other. Now, I went the roundabout way of making this illustration. The code says... When another black person, what you call a sellout, 
And there's no such thing as a black person selling another black person, selling them out. No such thing as that. Why? You can't sell what you don't own. You're already in prison. All black people are in prison. So if one prisoner says they like it like it is, and the other one says I don't like it like it is, that's just a disagreement among prisoners. But it doesn't give either, either one of them any more power. So one shouldn't go after the other. The code says, when any non-white person says, if I'm, and I've been on panels where a white person or a black person has said, you know, to a mixed audience, it ain't no such thing as no white supremacy. And call me out as being a person who's spreading false information. And my response was, he can say what he wants to say. You know, I said what I wanted to say. And that's what the code says, how, to, how you handle it, in answer to the question. How do you handle that? You say he said what he said. And I say what I say. I say white supremacy exists and it should be gotten rid of. Now, the other, or another black person will say, white supremacy don't even exist. How can you get rid of something that don't exist? I don't agree with that. But he said what he said. But he's a fellow prisoner. I got no authority over him. He can say what he wants to say. I have to answer to the white supremacists. I don't answer to him anyway. They say, well, sometimes the white supremacists will put a black person in charge of you. It's still the white supremacists that put the black person in charge of you. So it's the white supremacists who did it, folks. Wake up and smell the coffee. Use logic. Use that logic. black person who tells you what to do, that, that, that taskmaster, that what they call the whipping boss, back in what they call plantation slavery, he's got no power except what the white supremacists give him. So if you've got an argument, it is always with the white supremacists. It's not with the person who has been assigned to whip you as a fellow slave. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, we have about a minute and 30 seconds in this uh, first hour, Mr. Fuller. So quickly, I need to go to your book so we can go to the second hour. Yes. You can get the book by going to ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. And things like what we're talking about right now are, are questions are asked and answered in the book. Because all problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. It's a huge section on sex about all of the questions that a black female, particularly, of course, a black male, too, should do the same thing, equality. That's what we should have. Ask questions about each other when they first meet. If it looks like they are going to get into an interaction or so-called relationship that's very personal and up close, you might say. And all of the questions that you ask and answer before that first trip to the bedroom, there are dozens and dozens of questions to be asked and answered. And you say, well, that's a weird way of going about doing things. Everything in counter-racist science is weird mm -hmm. because we have encounter racism. Okay. So it'll be new. But it can be, get to be routine. Alrighty. All right. We can so, get it by going to producejustice.com. That's how you get oh, the textbook. All right. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. For those of you who will have to depart us for this uh, hour, uh, thank you for listening. And do come back uh, for next week's show. But for those who will stay around to listen, we have another hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. So stay tuned so we can uh, get through this hour. Got a lot of callers, a lot of things to say. So stay tuned for the Counter Racist Code Show here on blogtalkradio.com and will re be reproduced at producejustice.com. Thank you for listening, and we will be reconnected in about 10 seconds from now.
All right. Good morning and welcome to the second hour of the Counter Races Coach Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. and your mommy, your co host, Mr. Bobby. This is December the 7th, 2021's uh, edition. And if you would like to get in contact with the show, as we have 22 callers online right now and 60 minutes due to math. Yeah, okay. You see what I'm up against. Okay. Uh, 516-453-9921 is the number to call. Press the number one button, and you will get in line. And so let me get off the air, uh, or rather get off so we can get you on. Please, ma'am, please, sir, we have more callers than time, so make your questions, please, short to the point so Mr. Fuller can answer it. Okay, let's go out to L.A. Swa, you're on with Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, please. Let me see if I can get you in here. Okay, Swa, buffering. Okay, there you go. Grant Risey, Mr. Bobby, Grant Risey, Mr. Fuller. Yes, My sir. question is, maybe for Jaren, is um, were you able to teach your offspring counter racism? If so, how? All righty. Thank you. Mr. Fuller? Same way I do on the air. That's how. See, that's not, racism is not something separate from existence. You just talk about it like you talk about the grocery bill. You just tell the truth. That's all we have to do in these schools. All this school controversy about whether we should have critical race theory or how should we talk about race. You talk about race just like you talk about anything. Just tell the truth. Mr. Barber said that last week on this show. I think, you know, last week or the week before. Yeah, 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 just tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just tell the truth. Just tell it like it is. We say that, but in an actual situation, we don't do it. We just say, what's the truth? That's the first question. In any school or in dealing with, you know, when, you know, you say, how do you, what do you tell young people? Years and years and years ago, when people would ask me that question, because that question is always asked, you tell young people or any people the same thing you tell young people or any people. You tell them the truth. Yes, sir. And when do you tell it? It's when a question comes up. People have questions. And you say, did this happen or didn't it? And you find out what the truth is, and you tell it. You say, well, yeah, that happened, or that didn't happen, and why? And if they ask you more questions, you answer those questions. See, a lot of black people were taught at an early age, and I think it came kind of came out of what you call plantation slavery. Shut up, boy. You ask too many questions. Well, now, that calls for another question. How many questions are too many? Because you try to try to find the truth about everything. Because if you don't find the truth, you can't go to the next step. You cannot produce justice without finding truth first. Okay. And you can't produce correctness. When you don't have truth, you have what? Confusion. Confusion. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to have your young people, old people, any kind of people be confused about anything. Tell it like it is. (laughs) Absolutely. Don't add Uh, nothing to it. Don't take nothing from it. Tell it like it is. Tell it like it is. Thank you, Swa. Thank you so much. All right, Darnell, we got you coming up, and then Mar- Mar- Monica after that. Let's go. Thank you, Swat. Don't be a stranger. Uh, let's see here. Darnell, got you on very quickly for Mr. Fuller. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Good morning, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, sir. Yeah, uh, my question for Mr. Fuller today is real quick. Why do people get frustrated when you ask them questions according to the code? You can ask them why. See, that calls for another question. See, I'm going to go back to it again. I'm going to keep saying it until it sinks in everywhere, all over the world. All problems are solved 
underline all, run back and underline all, and put it in neon lights. All, 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 all problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. So if a person says, I'm frustrated by what you're saying to me about race, then you can say, why are you frustrated? And then behind that have about 200 other questions Mm -hmm. ready, ready to go before they even answer the first question. Because it will take questions and answers will take everybody right where they should be. That's a guarantee. Mm -hmm. It won't take everybody where they want to be, but they'll take everybody right where they should be. That's that's rock-solid code. Rock solid. That's rock solid universal logic. If you're mm-hmm. ever going to be a universal man or universal woman, it's through the process of questions and answers. Yes, sir. And every question has to be answered. You don't move to the second question until the first question is answered. So yeah, you absolutely. Ask, uh, so you you ask that person, why are you frustrated? Are you frustrated? Or you can ask them, are you frustrated? If they didn't say they're frustrated, don't say that they're frustrated. That's another thing. Don't accuse somebody of being something that they say they're not. You ask them on that. Say, are you frustrated by what I'm saying? And if they say, yeah, I'm frustrated, then you'll say, why am I? Why are you frustrated? And don't start asking or don't interfere with the answer, and don't ask the second question until the first question is answered. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you get what? Confusion. Get confusion. You don't want oh. that ever. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, for Clayton, Future Begins, Lasherion, Tiz Wiki, Arasu Ali, and Asenia, I had you scheduled down to ask your questions since you used... Um, the Gmail account, but we have so many questions today. I'm going to put that off till next week, and hopefully, we'll get a, an opportunity to ask your questions. But we are we're really kind of up against the clock, even though we have 52 minutes to go. But anyway, I got you down and um, plan on answering your questions. Um, let's see, who was it? Was that Monica? Uh, okay. Let me see if I can go to Monica. Monica, New York, I believe, in Brooklyn. Yeah, hey, okay. Brooklyn in the house. Go ahead, Monica. Hello? Yeah, you're on. Go ahead. Oh, okay. It's Buffalo, New York. Oh, okay. I'm going to say it's my fault, okay? Anyway, Buffalo, go. Oh, no yeah, problem. Monica, the, li- the library people. Yeah, go ahead, Monica. Yes. Go ahead, Charlie. Yes. Yeah. I've been up. I've been on every week, so I'm not gone. I've just, just been hired to get in. But my question okay. is... Um, Mr. Fuller, why do you believe, um, I would say black people specifically, why are they concerned with everything and everybody else but not the race, but not race issues or, or race problems? Because I can have a conversation, and this, this has happened with many different ages, whether it's a teenager, you know, uh, elder, someone in their, you know, whatever. And the person, they always go back to protecting everybody. So can you give me an expl- explanation? Um, I know you just briefly talked about the white supremacy is the most to blame, but is, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Why black people don't want to talk about the race problem? Well, they and seem talk to be about everything about, else, but well, they seem to be more so concerned about everything and everybody else. Like I could be talking about concerned in what area. way? Uh, let's just say I'm talking about something on TV or religion or economics, and I use examples oh, okay. like black people. Okay, just I can because... say like police shootings. Do you get what I'm saying, Mr. Fuller? Well, what like I could I be have... talking about police. Okay. Well, you. I was going to give you an example if you didn't quite understand. Okay, you can go right ahead. Give an example. Okay, like I could, I could bring up the police shootings. Let's use that as an example. And you give bring up the police the... shootings. Yes. Okay. And, and you're talking to I a black bring... person about the police shootings. Yes, and the person will go back to this happens to everyone. 
This is happening to white people. That's done on purpose. They're just putting images of black people on TV to confuse you. But they'll do this with everything that we're talking about. It could be a money issue. It could be buying a home. Does that make sense? And I'm just wondering why are people stuck on worrying about everybody and not the race issue part of things? Well, you can ask the people that you're talking to. That's what I do. That's not, you know, I ask people, first of all, you can go to page 171 and 172. That's why I'm saying that 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 will, that will read right where you need to go. First of all, you just ask a person, what do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? It's just four four questions. What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? How do you plan to do it? And what do you expect the constructive results to be? See, if a person doesn't want to talk about racism, you talk about what the person wants to talk about. But you start off with those four questions. And if you try it, page 171, 172 of the textbook for victims of white supremacy, 2016 edition, on page 171 and 172, you have four questions there that you first ask yourself, but then you ask everybody else those same questions. Why? Because everybody wants something. You're saying that yourself in this in this question that you just asked me. See, people want to talk about this. They want to talk about the school system. They want to talk about money. They want to talk about, okay, what do you want to do? And let them say what they want to do most. Start with the thing that they want most. The thing, because everybody wants to do something more than they want to do something else. Why do you want to do it? How do you plan to do it? And what do you expect the constructive result to be according to your plan? See, now, when black people plan anything, that's automatically talking about they're going to be involved with white people. Because white people in the system of white supremacy make the plans for black people. See, so whatever a black person has planned, they're going to have to be dealing with the white supremacists. I don't care what your plan is. And you just mentioned one illustration. I mean, getting enough money to buy a house. Hey, you ain't going to get no money, and you ain't going to be buying a house, or you ain't going to be breathing, really, if you're black and on this planet without dealing with the white supremacists one way or another. But you're going to have to tell a black person that. You let them wind up telling you. See, that's the key. Yes, sir. Don't get frustrated by talking about race to black people. Black people will bring up race themselves because they have to. I don't care how they start off talking. Just let them keep talking. Let them keep talking. And finally, they're going to be saying, well, the reason I can't do it is because I didn't have a job. Well, why didn't you have a job? See, that's a question. Well, well, this, this 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 black supervisor that they got now already. See, they're talking about race. And don't even know it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she she kept snitching on me and and kept doing this and doing that and picking on me and whatnot. So finally, I told her off, and they called me in the office, and she got me fired. And that's what I say about black people. They 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 they, they ain't got no loyalty. They don't try to help you. They just try to down you and all like that. Now they're talking about race all the time. And so you can just ask, well, why did the supervisor back her up? You know, just one question after another. That's all you got to do. And yes. say, well, the supervisor was white. Oh, oh, hold it right there. The mm-hmm. super- or they might say her supervisor was black. Say, well, who was his supervisor? See, ask that question. Say, well, Mr. Graham, you know, okay. Is Mr. Graham white or black? Well, you know, what's the yes, color sir. classification of Mr. Graham? Well, Mr. Graham is a white man, and he backed them both up in getting me fired. Well, that seems to be your problem. Your problem was not with them. Your problem was with Mr. Graham. He's the one that, you know, he backed them up, so that's it. 
You look at the bottom line. And you don't want to talk about race? Hmm. You wasn't supposed to be fired, and you got fired? Mr. Graham fired you. They didn't. They don't own that job. Mr. Graham owns the job, like Mr. Graham owns them, like Mr. Graham owns you. Wake up and smell the coffee. <laughs> okay. This is the system of white supremacy in. Mm-hmm. All right. All That's right. when you can jump in, I mean, and put that bottom line on where they led you. See, you don't lead people to talk to racism. Hmm. You lead them to talk about whatever problem they have. And they yes, will lead you to racism. That's a guarantee. Guarantee. Uh, yes. Monica, before I let you go, did uh did the library up there in Buffalo get get Mr. Fuller's book in there? As, uh, as far as you know. I'm yeah, sorry. They're working on it. They're working uh, they, on it? Yes. Okay. Good, because uh, we do remember the call. Thank you so much, Monica. Okay. Mr. Bobby, uh, can I just leave with one thing and just tell Mr. Fuller, um, he did answer it, but I just wanted to let him know, some some black people take a premise where they think they can use righteousness to solve the race problems. So I just wanted to end with that. Okay, Th- thank you so much. Well, you know, well righteousness, it that's depends that's on what the definition point. is. Okay, okay. Okay. Thank you. See, you asked the question, what do you mean by righteousness? See what I mean? All you got to do is just keep asking questions, and don't stop asking questions. Stay in the question lane. It'll take you where you need to go every time. That's a guarantee. Guarantee. I got to emphasize that. I can't emphasize that enough. Have Mm -hmm. a thousand questions on just one thing. Uh, I mean, you know, you have a thousand questions about one question, okay? Until you find to have all the answers to every question. That's the key. That's, That's the, the key, key to the universe. Okay, for those that are just tuning in, you're, you're listening to the Counter Is Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. I am the co-host, Mr. Bobby, and we are taking your telephone calls if we can at 516-453-9921. And we're going to go to the Black Mermaid uh, right now. Black Mermaid, you're on, Mr. Fuller. What is your question, please? Yes, my question is, is the goal to get the white supremacists to like and or love non-black people? Yeah, I, I hear sort of an echo. So okay, uh, could you repeat your question, uh, Black Mermaid? Yes, my question is, is the goal to get the white supremacists to like and or love non-black people? Do you ask white people to like and or love black people? Yes, the white supremacists. Do we want the white supremacists, the white supremacists to like and or love non-black people to treat them right? No. First of all, we don't know what we mean by love and like. We haven't even defined our terms. That's why I have a word guide that you can get by going to producejustice.com. And one thing that the code does say, you never ask anybody for love, ever, ever, under any circumstance, do you ask somebody to love you. That's a no-no. That's a code violation big time, counter-racist code. And you never ask for an apology, ever. And you never ask for respect. Ever. Now, you never ask for love. Why? Because if a person loves you, you won't be able to beat them off with a stick. Hmm. All right? <laughs> you know, so if you ask a person to love you, a white supremacist will say, oh, since you're not defining love, yeah, I love you. All right? Now get in that ditch. <laughs> I mean, you know, words are, you know, we get, we can't get fascinated by words. That's why an apology, if you have to ask for an apology, or have to ask for love, it's not worth nothing. Anything, you know, like that, apologies and love, and you definitely don't ask for respect, because that's something you give yourself. 
And how do you know when you're giving it to yourself? You're not lying to yourself. Mm -hmm. See, the only source of respect is self-respect. You can't get it from somebody else. It's impossible to get respect from somebody else. We often confuse respect with what? Courtesy. Now, if a person is discourteous to you, if you say good morning to a person and the person says, look, just rolls their eyes and don't say nothing, and you, you say good morning, you know, and they don't, but they say good morning to everybody else, that's, you might say that's being discourteous. But you don't ask a person to be courteous. That's up to them. You just show courtesy. I, I'll, you know, give you an illustration. If I went to work every day and I spoke to everybody, good morning, and everybody just looked at me and looked at the ceiling or looked away and didn't even say nothing, all right? Or a person might say, I don't want your good morning, Okay. I know whether it's a good morning or not. I don't need to get it from you. I don't need your wishes either. I don't need nothing from you. Get out of my face. Now, you can say that person is being discourteous. And what you do is say, thanks for telling me. Mm -hmm. you know? And you just don't say good morning to them anymore. But you say good morning to everybody else, even if everybody else hasn't told you to stop. You be courteous. The code says never let anybody be more courteous than you. Mm -hmm. But you don't ever ask anybody to be courteous to you, ever, under any ever. circumstance. See, codification and all of it is about getting control of every situation. And the first thing you control is yourself. Is yourself. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Black Mermaid. Going down to... Macon, Georgia. George, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Quickly, please. Hi, um, Mr. Bobby. Hi, Mr. Fuller. I wanted to ask, um, there's been many reports recently about the uh, global population in terms of demographics. Um, in Europe, every country in Europe, the population is accelerating uh, downward. The birth rates are going down. This is the case all over the world in countries such as China and Japan and India, places that are known for having uh, huge populations. And at the same time as this is happening, um, this century is projected that Africans, the continent of Africa is supposed to have a population boom. And since in the developed world um, populations are going down, these are people who um, need doctors, nurses, um, husbands, wives, um People of different uh, constructive, uh, they need people of constructive value who just aren't being born. Um, do you think the, um, the, uh, this downward trend in populations in the developed Western world um, will lead to them needing um, Africans, non-white people, to be um, more constructive and thus weakening the system of white supremacy? Uh, black people will never be uh, constructive in a system of white supremacy. Uh, we can evolve out of it, we should be, but you, we can never be the quality of people, what the code calls quality people, in the system of white supremacy, because the white supremacists are not quality people. And since they dominate the non-white people of the planet, we pick up all of their habits uh, of destruction, just about everything, because they see to it that we do. Drugs and everything, that all comes from them. And they see to it that we're just a worthless people compared even to the white supremacists. And they keep it that way. That's what white supremacy is about. But white supremacy is about not about goodness and righteousness. It's about evil. And they want everybody to be evil like they are, but not as evil as they are, and certainly not as powerful as they are. So we are a people who are nowhere near the quality of people that we should be, regardless of the population, regardless of how, whether we have a lot of children or whether we don't. 
The white supremacists control populations anyway. They tailor populations. They'll look at a segment of black people, and they'll say, well, there's too many of them uh, at this particular place at this particular time. It's bad for business because racism is a business. So they say, well, how many are there? Well, there's about 40 million there now, and we project in a few years that 40 million is going to be 60 million. Now, we can handle the 40 million. We handle them very well. 60 million is a little too much. So what they'll do is start some type of conflict, or they'll poison the water, or they'll poison the air, or they'll do something where that extra 20 million just don't get born. I mean, they die, and, you know, women start having babies, and most of them die. Why? Because the white supremacists got all kinds of ways of making black people die. Just like any prison master, you can kill off your prisoners any time you want to. It's called racial population tailoring in the code book. Mm-hmm. They tailor populations. A lot of black people say, they're committing genocide. They're trying to get rid of all the black people on the planet. Mm-hmm. Well, if they wanted to do that, we'd been gone. I mean, that's no big deal. Getting rid of black people, killing black people, who's going to stop them? Who cares? Black people don't even care. Mm-hmm. Black people don't care about black people dying in huge mm-hmm. numbers. We pick up the paper every day, 300 in, Cal- in California, 200 in of the state of Illinois, uh, 280 killed each other uh, in Texas, the state of Texas today. I mean, whole hum, turn to the sports page. I mean, we don't care. Black people don't care about black people killing black people. We get all up in arms about some white person killing one black person, all right, and we're ready to demonstrate. We're not demonstrating about nothing. If it's 200 black people killing 200 other black people, that's, you know, well, is this one? That, that, that's our culture. That's the ghetto. You know, mm-hmm. write a song about it. Yes. Kill some more. Mm-hmm. We're just as crazy as we can be. <laughs> All righty. Uh, since you mentioned that, could it be, this is just a question, Mr. Fuller, could it be that this, these, uh, 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 could it be? Not it, not that it is, but could it be that these viruses and, and uh, that are all of a sudden a very prominent now, uh, whatever they are, COVID nineteen and Delta and 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 the and the latest one, could it be uh, possibly a scheme of racial tailoring through sure. elimination of people? Mm-hmm. Sure, it could be. It could yeah. be. anything and anything that's happening that shouldn't happen. The code calls them what? The racial usual suspects. Usual suspects. The white supremacists. Anything that happens on the planet that should not be happening that affects non-white people, the racists are the usual suspects. Now, a black person, like the book says, and this is very important, should never, ever call a white person a racist. Ever. Ever. In the, as long as you're in the system of white supremacy. Don't ever do that. But if the white person says, oh, if the white person asks the question, are you implying that I am a racist, that this judge in this court is a racist? You say no to your lawyer or to, you know, if, say if you're in a court situation or anywhere, really, a classroom situation. No, no, Your Honor. You know, I'm not implying that. I am saying that the person could be. Why? Because logically speaking, racism does exist, which means somebody is a racist. But since I don't have a master list of who is and who isn't, I suspect that any person who is classified as white in a white supremacist system, could be a racist. So I suspect that 
the judge could be a racist. Could be. I'm not saying could. the race the judge is, but mm-hmm. I'm saying the racist the judge could be. Why? Because other white people have sometimes found judges, and they said that the judge was a racist, even so though it was a judge. So he says so suspected as being a racist. Yes. Okay. So, you know, it's possible that a person who is in a position of judgment could be a racist. And that's yes. exactly how you say it if you're a person of color. Got it. But you never Got call it. a person a racist. Okay. You say, I suspect a person could be. Okay. And with that, we'll say this. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. here and heard on blogtalkradio.com. The program is also reproduced at producejustice.com. As a matter of fact, immediately after the show. So if you'd like to call in, and please do, you may do so by calling 516-453-9921. Press the number one button and be sure to give the call screener your name so that I can make an attempt to uh, call you. You can also uh, get into the chat room by going to the blogtalkradio.com, and there's a little area there where you can go to produce, produce justice and then put on the chat and there you are in the chat room and I'm going to tell you right now they are off the chain in the chat room thank you chatters Woo, so many of them there you can also gmail me at the numeral 7 Mr. Bobby the numeral 7 Mr. Bobby at gmail.com don't do that though because I'm so backed up with them that I don't have proper time to to get to them. I do plan on getting to them, as I have read to this morning, but the callers have been so much that um, I had to forego. But I did let them know that I have them scheduled for our next program, so hopefully we can uh, we can get to that. If you when, you when you do call in, please be brief so that Mr. Fuller can answer your question. Okay, I think I got all the laundry out of the way. Corey. In El Paso, Texas, uh, you're on for it. Hey, uh, this is Bob Hammond. How are you doing? Good, sir. Uh, yeah, my question was, and one question was, so if you say you're facing racism in the workplace and you file a complaint and they don't take it seriously because the person did not blatantly uh, say racial slur against you, uh, how, what's the best way to combat that according to the code. I have a book, but I haven't read it fully yet. I, I, I've been giving it through with like a, well, you think kind of like a reference. But how do you combat racism when you know that they're not going to take, if, if you say you're just facing, uh, facing a situation where you're seeing that you're being targeted versus the white person messes up all the time and is not targeted. How do you combat racism in an unfair huh? white supremacist workplace? I'm not hearing any, I'm okay. not hearing that question at all. Okay, okay, Corey. I don't know if you're in a car or whatever, but could you slow it oh, okay, down so that Mr. F- Fuller can hear you? Is that better? Is that better? Yeah, now? that's better. Much better. Okay. And slow, okay, and so slow question, your question down. Okay, Mr. Fuller. Okay, so the question is, how can you combat uh, race uh, racism in the workplace when you're, but the person is a refined racist and is not just blatantly calling you a racial slur? But it's targeting you for punishment or maltreatment, but they're not doing it blatantly. So how do you if, how do you combat that when you know that their the human resources department is a joke? You, you, look at what is be, you, you look at what is being done, and you ask the question: Is this the correct way of doing what is being done? Or should this be done at all with anybody? In particular, on a job situation, that comes under what they call in the Northwestern Hemisphere, equal protection of the laws, 14th Amendment, Constitution. That's what I used to do on the job. I would go straight to a, depending on where you are in the world, if some, some places they don't have a Constitution, but in the Northwestern Hemisphere, they have something called the Constitution of the United States. So you use the tools that you have. 
that you've said you've been given. And you say, is this the way everybody is supposed to be treated? Everybody. Because if everybody is not treated this way for the same reason and the same circumstances, that needs to be what? Investigated. And another thing, on a job, never accuse anybody of doing anything. Call for an investigation. I call it the three eyes. Inquiry, that means to inquire. Investigate, that's the second I. And then indictment, meaning somebody will be accused of doing something they shouldn't have done. But what you do is call for an investigation. Anytime anything comes up that you think shouldn't be happening, that's what you do. You you go to whomever is supposed to be in authority. I mean, the, the, you ask for an audience with the person who is supposed to be at the highest rank in wherever you are or the person that they send you to. And if that person doesn't give you the answers that you're looking for, you ask that person a question. Who can I talk to that can answer the question? Because I want an investigation. I'm requesting an investigation. And they'll say an investigation of what? To see whether or not the Constitution is being violated. That's the answer. Uh, in the Northwestern Hemisphere, what they call the United States of slash for America. In other parts of the world, it would be different because they got different laws. Yeah. But the laws they have here, they say that you come under the Constitution in the Northwestern Hemisphere in what they call, quote, unquote, the United States. So the Constitution yeah. has an amendment to that Constitution that says, which is a part of the Constitution, amendment just means an addition, called the 14th Amendment, equal protection of the laws. And then they have a fifth amendment called Due process, meaning going about doing things the correct way. So you want to find out if everything is being done the correct way that will apply to everybody in order to get equal protection, equal protection, protect me from anything that's happening that shouldn't happen. I want an investigation to find out if this is what should be done to everybody under these type of circumstances. And if the person says, well, we can't answer those questions, then you have a question right after that. Like I said, all problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. So the person that says, I can't answer that question, you say, well, who can? Because somebody is supposed to be able to answer questions about any violation or perceived violation, you don't know whether it's a violation or not, of the Constitution. And I'm saying that's in any setting, anywhere, on a yes, job. Sir. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this for all black people, all people of color, particularly. Go straight to the Constitution on any job. I mean, uh, company regulations and all like that, that's just something that people make up as they go along. But nobody is supposed to violate the Constitution of the United States, which means everybody is supposed to have protection from mistreatment. Yes, sir. Okay. That's what you have been told. But you have to make that real, and you do that by asking questions. Asking and questions. And asking questions means you call for an investigation of the entire matter, and you don't stop. You just keep saying, who can answer these questions? Who can answer these questions? And then you give the questions to the person who's supposed to be able to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. Is this the way you're supposed to treat everybody? Because if one person is treated one way and another person is treated in a different way about the same thing, that calls for a whole bunch of questions right there. So yes, that's sir. not equal. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All righty. Uh, let's see here. Now, my board has just been wiped clean of no callers, which I don't believe, but I'm going to try this here. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Uh, I don't have your name here, but uh, they have you down on some time. Uh, good morning. I don't have your name, so I, I'm not disrespecting you, but what is your question for Mr. Fuller? Okay. Once, okay. We'll, we'll go up here then. Let's go to Terrence it has here. Wait a minute, Terrence, if I can get you in here. Okay, Terrence, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question very quickly, please? Hey, good morning, Mr. Fuller. Uh, VGQ, um, I think as we're trying to solve problems, what I found out is that we don't know how to ask and answer questions succinctly with yes or no and then elaborate. So that's my VGQ. Um my question for Mr. Fuller is, um, has he experienced anything uh, regarding this holiday time that was of interest to him that he'd like to speak about? Okay. Thank you. Mr. Fuller? Have I experienced what? Say that again. Have you experienced any situations uh, during this holiday season that you'd like to speak on regarding Holidays or holiday, holy days? All days are holy, and that's in the code book. There's no such thing as a special day, except every day is a special day. Every day counts. We don't have any throwaway days. It comes under economics, time and energy. The whole universe, time, energy. The sun is about time and energy. People are about time and energy. Birds are about time and energy. Leaves on trees, time, energy. Everything in creation is about time and energy. So these things happen in days and nights, that we call them, uh, sun rotation. In this universe, we have a thing called the sun, and, and things move around the sun, which means that we have night and day on account of the sun. And uh, when the sun is shining on things and all like that, we call that day. And when the sun goes down, that means you move this place that you call the earth moves around the sun. So it moves in such a position that you get what we call night. And so all of these count. Every last one of them. So there's no such thing as a holiday except every day is a whole day, a holy day. Holy, whole. That's all. And you use time and energy during those days, all of them, to do something that is what? Produces a constructive result according to what? Logic. So every move that you make. So going out and spending money, I'm going to say that about this particular time. Tighten up on that money. Just decide, try it on for size. Just say, I ain't spending nothing. I'm just throwing this out as a suggestion because I think it's an excellent compensatory counter racist codified suggestion. Let's call a little conference and say, you know what? Let's just agree not to spend nothing. Make do with what we got. Okay. We ain't spending a dime. We ain't going out to no so-called Black Friday's or nothing. <laughs> we ain't doing it. We ain't going to put up a tree. I stopped putting up one in 1960. Why? I use logic. When people ask me, Fuller, where's your tree? Don't you have a tree? You can put one up? It's kind of late. I say, no, I'm not putting one up. Not now, not ever. And they say, why? I say, because I got plenty of trees. And I took them through the window. <laughs> <laughs> I say, now, there's one in that store across the street. That's my tree. They say, oh, Fuller. That ain't your tree. It ain't in your living room. I say, it's my tree. 
And what do you mean by living room? Every room is my living room, if I'm in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you mean? I got a room that I live in and other rooms I'm dead? <laughs> Come on, that ain't logical. <laughs> I'm, see, I'm talking about black people have to learn to use pure logic. Yes, sir. Stop paying attention to this, all the noise around you and cut right to the chase and go for the logical conclusion because logic rules the universe. We yes, should be trying to be universal people. Mm-hmm. So I tell them, I, I'm in Washington, D.C. Every Christmas, I got one of the grandest Christmas trees you'll ever see. <laughs> it's right down there on the White House lawn. And I haven't <laughs> even seen it. And I tell people, I haven't seen it. They'll say, well, are you going down to see it? I say, no. But it's my tree. I pay taxes. <laughs> Y'all can go down and see it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it, yeah. But if you want to know where Fuller's Christmas tree is, go down and look at it at the White House lawn. And if you are somewhere where you're not in Washington and you can't see that tree, just look at the nearest tree to you. That's full of three, too. Why? It's That's in the universe cool. with me. In the u- That's why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if I had one in my living room, I wouldn't be looking at it most of the time. I'd be out there on that job trying to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough. That's a good one. Uh, speaking about that, Mr. Fuller, uh, I was just given a Gmail from um, Brother Kelvin DuBose, and this is what he said, and I'm going to read it. He said, Please have Mr. Fuller mention being on the Carl Nelson Show this week. Thank you. Now, yes, I have no I knowledge am. of that. Go ahead, Mr. Fuller. I'm sorry. I am on the Carl Nelson Show Thursday. Okay. Uh, let's see. This is Tuesday? Yes, sir. So from 5 until 7, WOL 1450 on your radio dial. And also 95.9, I believe it is, FM, FM, on your radio dial, Thursday, day after tomorrow. What day is this? Day is the 7th. That's the 9th. Tomorrow's yes. Wednesday. It'll be Thursday from 5 to 7, Eastern Standard Time, PM. Carl Nelson Show two-hour interview, and you can go to ProduceJustice.com, and you'll see it. It's on that website, advertised. Okay. Uh, that's, that, now, that is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my brother, Mr. DuBose. Um, uh, and then uh, Gary on the uh, Gmail said this, uh and then I'm going to go to your book right after this. So let's see. Let's make this one short and sweet. How can how can we protect ourselves from mass shooters? That's what he wanted to know. Protect yourself from mass shooting uh, as best you can. And mass shootings are everywhere. Always assume when you leave the house, if you're a black person anywhere on the planet, particularly in the northwestern hemisphere, and in a whole lot of other places, you try to stay away from people if you can. And the code says that anyway. Not just because of COVID-19. The code says rather than seek out crowds of people, you should be going the other way so that you can produce yourself or, or rather reproduce yourself as a better person. See, you distance yourself from anything that looks like danger. Yes. Now, you can go among throngs of people if you don't sense any danger. But if you're anywhere where people are, have to be crushed to death or stomped to death, and shooting is subject to break out anywhere, you just try to... Pick your places as best you can. But Mm -hmm. realize, in the system of white supremacy, every place is dangerous. You're in danger anywhere you happen to be. One thing about it is, the danger may be greater in some places than it is in others. Because the white supremacists 
until most recently, they are usually in places where you have more protection. Mm -hmm. So if a black person is in a crowd of white people, they may have greater protection from other black people. Now, this is tragic, but that's the truth. Yeah, it's the truth. But you won't have protection from the white people in that crowd who take a sudden dislike to you being there. Now you get away from that situation. But you always have to ask for the white supremacists to protect you as best you can. As best you you can. can't, you protect yourself as best you can. And how do you protect yourself? Stay away from all people where you think there might be of some danger. Don't go toward that. Don't go toward a lot of black people, particularly in a crowd in this day and time, in the year 2021. 2021, yes. Because some black person may have a gun and decide that they got a beef, quote, unquote, with somebody and start shooting all over the place, and you get hit. That's the truth. We need to face the truth. Tragic arrangement there. Mr. Fuller, this is the time that we have to we have to do this. We gotta talk about your book. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh a lot of the things that I've said, including what to say on the job, I mean, you know, uh, uh or in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. Uh, that comes under the eighth area of activity under labor, I have some suggestions to make. And they are scattered in economics and other areas of activity. There are nine areas of activity, but economics is not separate from other areas. Like, that's the first area, economics, the use of time and energy. It's not separate from education. Education is connected with economics, how you use your time and energy. You use time and energy to get an education. So they're not separate. They're just different words. And entertainment is connected with Education, in fact, education should be the biggest form of entertainment for black people. Black people shouldn't have celebrations. We should have, uh, we shouldn't celebrate, brother. We should educate. In other words, everything that black people do in the field of entertainment in the system of white supremacy should be connected with learning something that's going to be of what? Constructive value. Something that produces constructive results. All of black people's entertainment and all of black people's uh, economics, education, labor, law, sexual activity, religion, should produce what? Constructive results which means all of these areas are connected. The war and counter-war in that area, the book covers that. What to do, what not to do in this conflict when it gets violent and counter-violent. All right? And that's covered in the textbook. What to do in labor, what to say, what to say on a job, what not to say, what to say in politics. And what is politics? Some people say that, well, I don't engage in politics. Everybody is political. Everybody engages in politics based on what? According to what? Logic. Logic, yes, sir. So the biggest section in the textbook for victims of white supremacy is politics because politics has to do with people. Anything dealing with people is political. They say sometimes you separate religion from politics. That's impossible. You gotta have if you have religion, you have people involved in religion. So that's political. Yes, sir. Right there. If the people are not involved in religion, then you don't have that's that's not politics and religion. But I don't know of any religion that doesn't have people involved in it. 
Never heard of one. So I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that religion and politics are separate. See, but this is covered in the textbook for victims of white supremacy that you can get by going to ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. This is a question from last week. Um, somebody wanted to uh, know anonymously, did Mr. Fuller say that if somebody called his mama the B word and he was standing there, he wouldn't do anything? Is, is that correct, Mr. Fuller? Yes, I would do something. And what I would do is stand there about if I was standing there before the person did it. And what would I say? Nothing. Okay, why? I mean, I, why? Now, that's the question. All problems are solved through the process of questions and answers. Why would I? Yes. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, I wouldn't because it wouldn't produce a constructive result. That's why. Okay. Every move I... that I make is supposed to produce a constructive result. Constructive result. By yes. me not saying anything, that produces the greatest pro constructive result that it will ever be produced by anybody. It would. Why? Because the code says, I do not let any words that anybody other master me if I can at all avoid it. I always am the master of words. That's one of the first requirements of counter-racist codification. If you're talking about code, that's a part of Neely Fuller's code. That's a part of the United Independent Compensatory Code System concept, which is my book. Somebody yes, calls me a name, calls my mother a name. What have they done? Nothing. Nothing according to whom? Me and mm. my mother. Mm. We might look at the person, mm -hmm. and if the person is standing there with a gun or a knife, now we'll move away. We'll do that. Yes, sir. Because a gun and a knife means business. But mm. calling her the B word? or calling me anything that you want to call me, I mean, write them down at midnight, 2,000 things, and meet me at the bus stop and call me everything that you wrote down. And you wrote down 2,000 until my bus comes, because when my bus comes, I'm getting on the bus. <laughs> yeah. But as long as you're standing there just calling me that with everybody looking, I'll listen. And I'll listen. Intentionally, because I want to see what you're calling me. <laughs> and you know, you know, and when I get on the bus, I mean, you know, I, I just get on the bus because I'm waiting at the bus stop. So and it I, is. I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing. All right. So it. Is, so I'm it doing, is. See, I'm talking about. I'm talking about black people learning yes. how to master situations. Okay. Okay. See. So see. It, Math, see, codification is about every situation that you're in. Yes. You take charge. You take charge. And there's I got a you. scientific way of taking charge. So then, is it true That's that what sticks and stones is about? Is it huh? true that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me? Huh? Or words can harm you if okay. it's a lie. If it's a lie, thank you. All right, and but if it's a lie that people act on. See, you can tell a lie on somebody, but if nobody's going to act on a lie, so what? So what? I like that. That happens every day. <laughs> people tell yeah. lies every day, but nobody responds to the lie. So what? So, so what? It's the same, see, the code says, I don't ever call anybody a name except the name that that person wants to be called, even if that person changes their name every 15 minutes. Okay. The person went on the the person named John Clark, and he went on his lunch break, and he came back, and I said, "Oh, John, you're back from your your, your lunch break." See, my name ain't John. My John, okay. my name was John when I left for my left lunch break. My name is Abe now, Abraham. Okay, all right, right Abe. Out of the Bible. Gotta go. And so I say, okay, Abe. <laughs>
<laughs> you got to go because the clock is, is going down. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Sorry I had to interrupt, but i got to go because i got seconds left. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Hopefully we'll see you next week, and we'll try to do a better job. Thank you, Mr.